one of the single most effective things you can do to change the appearance of your body in the positive is to simply get stronger at the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. So today's episode, we're going to talk about those three lifts and specifically how to get stronger at those three lifts. Those three lifts are known as the big three. The three heavy hitters. The big three for a reason. I, I almost feel like we have to we have to hammer this um, more than usual. I was I was just on on Instagram yesterday and two different po uh, coaches coaches in our network and circle of friends, um, you know, are making posts about you don't need to squat, you don't need to deadlift, you don't need to bench press, yeah. like. And I, I really, uh, I hate that message. And it's not that it's not true. Like, of course, you could take those three exercises out and you could you actually do other stuff. yeah, do other things and build a great physique. But it, it brings so much value. Uh, and not just what it can do for the metabolism and sculpting your body, but even just the pursuit mm -hmm. of trying to get good at those movements have tremendous value. Yeah, it's like, look, you can you you don't need to use a shovel to dig a hole. You could definitely use a spoon, but one of them's gonna get there faster. And with these exercises, especially squat and deadlift, especially those two, getting uh, the kind of results that most people are looking for when they work out, where they develop uh, you know muscle, they sculpt their body, speed up the metabolism, which helps with with fat burning. it's it's very hard to replace those exercises with three other exercises. Um, you can you you can maybe do it with 10 or 15 other exercises, but then you've obviously got the limitation of things like recovery and time. But when it comes to bang for your buck, um, there's almost no comparison. There's a reason why they're known as the big three. There's a reason why those exercises are uh, preferred by strength athletes in many different sports, uh, both in bodybuilding, which is a presentation sport. Bodybuilders, uh, especially when they first start out, do those exercises quite a bit. Um, Powerlifters, obviously, that's their competition. Strong men uh, competitions. Olympic mm -hmm. lifters will do these exercises, even though they don't compete with those exercises. Um, coaches who coach athletes, football coaches and basketball and baseball coaches will incorporate these exercises in their routines. They just have tremendous, tremendous value. And especially when you're somebody who has worked out for less than a couple years, like, you know, gaining 50 pounds on your bench press or your deadlift or your squat, you're going to see really, really significant changes in the way you look from doing those things. Um, so, and the carryover for functionality is massive. So it's just, yeah. to me, it's stupid when people try, and, and I know what they're doing, what they're trying to do. And one of the hacks for getting, uh, attention on social media is to take a popular notion and try to find a way to counter it because then people mm -hmm. are like, Oh, what's this thing that I hear such good things about these exercises. Here's this person saying, I don't have to do them. So it gets to your attention. Well, but yeah, I mean, these exercises are hard and I think that's just something that's always like pretty obvious for people when they step into it. They're simple, very simple type of exercises and movements, but there's a lot of room for improving on the technique and sharpening a lot of little nuances that go into it that help you see it. Uh, almost immediately once you really sharpen certain types of techniques and, you know, you, you get into uh, these exercises uh, with all of uh, these different angles of like how I can improve. Um, and, and you see what that does in terms of uh, how, how it uh, translates to every other exercise. This, this is like yep. these exercises specifically uh, have the most carryover. They do. You know, one of my favorite examples is a personal example. Um, when we started the podcast, uh, Adam was still an active professional IFBB physique competitor. So he was at a very high level and physique has nothing to do with how much you can lift. It's literally you're on stage and they're, they're judging your physique. Okay. And up until that point, you know, Adam didn't do lots of deadlifts. He'd hardly. done them in workouts, but you hardly ever did them in your yeah. workouts. And then we started the podcast. There was a whole period there where all of us got competitive with each other. Um, and we want to see how good, you know, we could deadlift. And, you know, I'll let you tell the story because I remember when you came back after doing this and you were like, this is so weird. Like, I, I can row more. I could do more pull-ups. I could do all this other stuff. By, and I stopped doing those. Yeah, no. I, I At one point, uh, I was primarily doing just deadlifting. I mean, it really started to approach, like, my programming. Like, okay, the goal was to catch Sal and deadlifting. At that point, you were deadlifting so much more weight than I was. And I'm like, well, I've actually never tried to apply myself and see – 
if I could get really that strong in it. And I remember in order to do that, I had to eliminate a lot of the other stuff that I was doing because I was focusing so much on either deadlifting, it's like traditional conventional deadlifts or all the variations and other things that I could do to complement the deadlift. Like that's the that was program. the focus. That was the that was the main focus. So there was things like the the seated row. You know, I was still doing some lat pull down in there and things like that that um, that I hadn't done in there. Um, even like even like a uh, lying leg curls. Uh, I'd stopped doing stuff like that. And it blew my mind on eliminating those exercises in, in my routine for nearly a year and then returning back to them and PRing all of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I'm talking about lifetime PR. Like that's a, you, we talk on the show all the time about how difficult it is to see, you know, like big strength leaps in, in any of the exercises that we do because we've been training for so long. Yeah, you were already advanced, not like you were a beginner. Yeah, so of the, so you know, I've been doing those movements for a very long time and have incrementally gotten a little stronger over years and years of of you know lying lying leg curls and seated row and uh, you know, and then I I get this deadlift and I take my deadlift. I think I was when I first started, I was literally like deadlifting two hundred and something pounds. I mean, that's basically about where I was at. And worked my way all the way up to 550. And once I got to that point and I returned back to these exercises, um, that that's the only time that's ever happened, by the way, in my life where I've eliminated a specific movement and for something else and then returned back to that movement. And I was actually stronger. That's never happened. I've never stopped doing an exercise, did other exercises, came back to it, yep. and I was significantly stronger. It just, it, 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 it it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, or it's just not, you're, it's not, um, it's not common that you would do that where you would leave anything because the body is very specific the way it adapts to movements. And I know that and I understand that. So I wasn't expecting to get under the seated row or get under the lying leg curls and be able to move the weight up to uh, significantly higher than I ever had without doing it at least for a while. And so that was, and then visually what I had seen, I mean, I, I wish I had it. I got to find it somewhere. I know we've posted it a long time ago on this show. So those that have been listening have already heard and seen this story. But, you know, there's a very clear difference in the development of my back. And by the way, you bringing that up reminds me. I was just uh, watching Jeremy Buendia, who is the ex. I think he's, what, four or five time Mr. Olympia for men's physique. And he's now he's like barefoot squatting, barbell, backs, deadlifting, yeah, deadlifting, mm. and it's it's he's so bigger than he's ever been. Oh, bro, he looks insane. Yeah, he look he uh, he. I don't know if he's going to go into classic or what, but and he had obviously he had a, a champion physique already and has had won you know four or five championships already in in IFBB, and so he looked good already. But his his size, what he looks like now is he's already in, and it's only, I've only, I've been watching him do this for maybe the last year and a half, two years. I can't remember, you know, precisely, but he's now reintroduced those movements that were not a part of his training. And you're just seeing his body. And that was what I experienced. I'd already been an advanced lifter. I deadlifted and squatted sporadically in my routine, but it was never a, a cornerstone of my routine. When we got together was when I started to train that way, and the the leap that my physique had in that short amount of time was was unprecedented yeah, compared to anything else. What's up, everybody? Today's uh, giveaway is Maps Powerlift because today that's what we're talking about. If you want to get free access to Maps Powerlift, here's how you can maybe do that. Uh, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel. And turn on notifications. Do all those things, and if you win, we'll give you free. Uh, access to Maps Powerlift. We'll let you know in the comment section, by the way. Now, everybody else, Maps Powerlift right now is 50% off. Okay, just for this episode, limited time, 50% off. If you're interested, go to mapspowerlift.com and then use the code POWER50 for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. And to be clear, this doesn't mean that other exercises don't have value. This doesn't mean that that's what you should do necessarily. All this is highlighting is a personal experience that shows that, and I've seen this, by the way, with client after client after client after client, None, some of them advanced, most of them beginners, where I would just say, hey, let's just get you strong at this. And then you'd see this crazy carryover to other stuff. Yeah. That's what this is highlighting. What it's highlighting is there's very few exercises uh, and movements that have such a broad range of carryover to other exercises. What does this mean? This means that these exercises are extremely efficient and effective. Why is that important? 
Because the limiting factor, the biggest limiting factor when it comes to developing a nice physique and body is your ability to recover and the amount of time that you have. Those are the two biggest limiting factors. If you had unlimited recovery, then it wouldn't matter. You would just do all the exercises. You'd go to the gym and you'd have a list of 200 exercises and you'd do every single one and you'd be totally fine. But you can't because you, you're limited by your body's ability to recover. Anybody who knows anything about exercise, especially strength training, will tell you that. The second is limited time. You can't just work out all the time. You just can't. Most people can't, right? So you're going to go to the gym and you're going to get in there three days a week, okay? Four days a week or two days a week or one day a week. Well, we want efficiency and effectiveness. That's what we want. And what you get with the bench press and especially the squat and the deadlift is, a fi is, is something that's so efficient and so effective that they literally take the place of, many times, take the place of lots of other exercises. And this is why gaining, you know, 50 pounds on a squat or 50 pounds on a deadlift looks way different in the mirror than gaining 50 pounds on a leg press or a hack squat or a pull down or a cable row, right? It just looks way different in the mirror. And then for athletes, for athletes, oh my gosh, you know, when I competed uh, as a grappler in judo and jujitsu, um, if I got stronger in my deadlift, I could feel it on the mats, 100%. I got stronger in other exercises, and eh, maybe sometimes I did, sometimes <clears throat> I didn't. But when my deadlift was up, if I got a hold of you, we're you're going to get some frequent flyer miles because uh, I was a lot stronger. So it's just, these are exercises that have a lot of that carryover, have a lot of that power. So it makes a lot of sense, regardless of what your goals are. You don't have to do this all the time, but definitely do a cycle, yeah. a nice block of just trying to get stronger at these lifts. Well, what I like about these uh, specific exercises too is it highlights um, how important it is to have that synchronicity between all of your muscles and have everything working. Yep. With these compound movements, uh, you have to be able to communicate all the way from your fingertips to your toes. Like You have to be able to have that kind of control and, and be able to summon that kind of force uh, from your body. And so this really teaches you to uh, be able to even summon force. You, you're not, so your, your body is limited by its weaknesses, especially around the joints. And so uh, to, to, to be able to kind of figure out this process of how to uh, generate more force, um, this, is, this is what these specific exercises are very, very good at because um, there's, there's no way around it. You're either going to get stronger at them um, by, by being able to master that process or it's going to crush you. Yeah, you're, you're, what you're pointing out or you're talking about is the, the value these exercises have in regards to your central nervous system. Totally. This yeah. is also why one of my favorite things that Sal's ever said on this show was the analogy that he gave be, with, you know, speakers and the amplifier being your central nervous system and your speakers being the muscles and the, the, how important that is. And anybody that understands how, uh, you know, an amplifier works for speakers. You can have massive speakers, but if you have a really weak amplifier, you never get the full potential. The speakers are waste of time. The, yeah, that's right. So, and and in fact, the most people that understand uh, amplifiers and speakers would make the case that the amplifier is the most important piece because with that, you can get so much more, and you can continue to get bigger and bigger speakers. Right. So, and when you, I think of these movements, one of the simplest way that I can explain it to a client is that. By us training and getting good at these movements, we are investing in a better amplifier. Totally, we are yeah. we are upgrading your we are and and its potential uh, increases and, substantially. And by the way, all all exercises contribute to that, right. but none of them contribute at the level that those exercises. So if I have the ability, so to back to your other analogy with the the spoon and 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 the you know tractor or whatever, being shovel. the shovel or whatever to dig a hole or whatever, like. That, that that's just it like yes those other those other exercises are other ways to improve your central nervous system to improve your speakers but you're not going to improve them nowhere near as much as you can with the squat the deadlift and bench and so yep. and a lot of that has to do with the reason why most people don't do it which is the difficulty of it because it's hard it has a longer process to get adapted to so it takes me like if you do a bicep curl it doesn't take very long for your body to figure out how to do that movement really well. And then you progressively overload it, add some weight to it, mm -hmm. and then it adapts to that relatively quick. Man, you could be at the same weight of squatting for like six months and and the body still adapting from that. And it's because of the difficulty and the nuance 
of that movement because there's so much going on when you talk about the communication to all the muscles, synchronizing everything together. And that's a good thing. So the fact that it's difficult yeah. and it takes us a long time to get good at it and adapt to it is also means that we can reap benefits from it for a lot longer than other exercises. Yeah, just one thing to pile on uh, to all of this is an example of like, let's say you're bench pressing and there's just a little bit of a shift. You're not bracing uh, good enough. You're not anchoring your body down good enough. You're not going to be able to uh, create that kind of loud amplitude, right? From your, from your amp. Like it's not going to be able to give you that as much as you would. Once you learn that process of being able to really tighten all those other supporting muscles to be able to keep your body stable and secure. Now I can lift a lot more weight. Here's a good example for so, for someone. Someone explained it to me this years ago, power lifter explained it to me this way. And it was like, it made total sense. It's not, and, and the reason it, it's this conversation started was because I didn't understand why you know, grounding my legs and using leg drive would help my bench press. I was a kid and this power lifter was trying to teach me how to get a better bench press to develop, you know, better chest and shoulders and triceps. And he says, you know, drive into the floor with your legs. And I said, what do the legs have to do with a bench press? Right. My legs do nothing this is other chest than exercise. hold me, you know, I put my legs on the floor. Like, what, what are they doing? And he says, here, try this out. And he says, Sal, squeeze your right hand as hard as you can, but keep the rest of your body totally relaxed, including your face. So everything else has to be totally dead, but just squeeze your hand as hard as you can. And I did. And he says, now squeeze your hand as hard as you can, but go ahead and tense up the rest of your body. He goes, you notice the difference? I said, yeah, I can squeeze way harder. In fact, you do this naturally. You try and squeeze something as hard as you can. You'll notice the rest of your body turns, the harder you push that yeah, you squeeze, grit your teeth. the more you, yeah. grit the, the, you, you activate the rest yeah. of your body. Why is that? The central nervous system fires more juice when it's firing all, when the whole thing is firing. If I'm firing to my hand, it'll only power up with so much juice. If I fire up to the whole body, it's going to fire up more, not just because it's firing to the whole body more, but it's also firing more to my hand. What these movements do, because they utilize so many muscles, because they require stability and balance, because a squat requires you to also have a tight upper back and grip and core, because a bench press requires you to drive your feet into the floor and a deadlift requires you to grip your hands real tight, stay straight and strong, brace your core, your calves, your ankles, your knees, your hips. It is training your CNS. This carryover goes to every other exercise yeah. because when your amp is better, here's what happens. So using the amp and the speaker um, analogy, imagine now that the speaker had the ability to adapt to the amplifier. Imagine you have this like super intelligent AI speaker and the speaker adapts to the amplifier. So if the amplifier gives just enough juice to the speaker, speaker's going to stay the same size. But imagine if the amplifier fires more juice into that speaker and the speaker's like, uh-oh, we need to become bigger to handle the juice that the amplifier is putting out. Guess what happens? Your speaker then adapts and grows. This is what happens to your muscles. If your CNS is firing more effectively and efficiently, your muscles adapt by growing and by building. So you're not just stronger in the gym, which is great. A lot of people just want to get stronger too, but your muscles also adapt to this. Now there's value in bodybuilding training. There's value in figuring out how to connect to individual muscles. Mm -hmm. There's value in all that stuff. But today's episode's not about that. Today's episode, what I'm trying to convince people of is I don't care what your goal is. I don't care if it's fat loss. I don't care if it's aesthetics. And definitely, if you're interested in, in powerlifting, then you're going to want to listen. But I don't care what your goal is. If you go through a nice block of just getting stronger at these lifts, you'll see improvements regardless of what your goals are, even yeah. just athletic performance. All the way across the board. That's right. So let's start with the first important tip with getting a better bench press, squat, and deadlift, which is this. This may sound obvious, but you need to practice each movement often. Practice each movement often. Why? Because a lot of strength has to do with your ability to perform a movement with good efficiency and good skill. Strength is as much a skill as it is as much uh, muscles moving things. Okay? If you practice something more often, you get better at that and you're able to lift more weight, and then the adaptations happen faster. So to use a different example, it would be like trying to throw a baseball faster by not practicing throwing a baseball, by just working on the muscles that contribute to throwing a baseball. So imagine if you had two people, and one guy's like, I'm just going to work on all the muscles that are involved with throwing a baseball, so I'm just going to build those. Mm -hmm. And then the other guy's like, I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to practice throwing so I can get better at throwing and better, and better technique. 
who's going to end up throwing the baseball faster at the end of that experiment, right? Yeah. So practice the movements often because if you get better at the movements, you get stronger at the movements, then you build more muscle and you see better results. This is also the answer for the people that are that were listening to the first part of our rant here and going like, well, I can't do those movements or I'm, I, you know, I, I, every time I do it, I hurt myself. Or I'm not like part of doing these movements isn't necessarily always just loading the bar up and then squatting and squat more and squat more and squat more. Yeah, we it's, said practice. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it could be your body weight. It could be just the bar and you're not loading very much at all. It could be, you know, doing it and then videoing it and then critiquing what's going wrong with it. It could be hiring a coach or someone to help you get good at just that one movement. It could be noticing and realizing, oh, wow, like I have really poor ankle mobility. So then you're doing a lot of combat stretch. Maybe it's stuff that your hips are really tight and they bother you. So you're doing 90, 90 stuff. So you're doing all these things to complement doing the squat and practicing and getting good at it just like you would in any sport like you wouldn't just go and expect to play at an nba level game right away and just play with the players and without ever having learned how to dribble a ball or how to shoot it or do any of the skills that set you up for success right no i mean to kind of add on to that analogy with practicing like even Yes, the individual part of it, like if you're looking at it as I have these, you know, different components of what makes uh, a, a baseball throw um, effective, and, and I'm not like going to train each one of my muscles individually for that, but also too, like to be able to let, let's say I have a couple players playing together, like let, let's say they're trying to uh, turn a double play, right? You need to you need to practice with the team you need yeah. to practice with the other players so you know your other muscles being the other players in order to be effective and, and be able to really pull off the technique and sharpen the technique is to be able to run those drills constantly with everybody together contributing yeah it's so, so it's so cool too how you know i been doing this for 20 something years yet yesterday i lifted and i squatted and I'd been inconsistent for the last couple of weeks. And so I know I didn't need, I didn't need very much intensity to, to send a signal right to my body to adapt. And what I love about the squad is like, I, I could barely loaded the bar yesterday and just, you know, took my time and worked on my technique and the way my hips were opening up, how I was coming out of the hole, how I was, uh, you know, dropping down into the squat with real, and I mean, I'm just, I'm so sore from such, I can't do that with any other movement. I can't like yeah. come in and do a bicep curls and like, oh, I'm just going to work. Pounds. <laughs> just gonna, yeah. I'm just going to work on the technique. Yeah. With like 10 pounds today. I won't even feel it. You'll get nothing out of I'll it. I'll get nothing out of yeah, it. Uh -uh. But squat is, so, the squat, the deadlift, the, but these movements are so technical. Even after all these years of doing it, you know, all it takes is me being away for a little bit and I could barely load the bar and just be a, a, a technique day and get tremendous benefit from that. That's what's so special about those movements. Yep. All right. So number two is to focus on the movement and not on the muscles. All right. So that sounds weird, right? Muscles are moving the bar. What do you mean? Don't focus on the muscles. Okay. There's a time and a place when you're training your body and you're trying to hit your quads when you do an exercise or your lats when you're doing an exercise or your pecs or your delts, that's bodybuilding training. That also has value. But with this specific topic of getting stronger at these lifts, don't worry about what muscles are activating and where you feel it. Practice the movement. Focus on maximizing the movement. So when you get into your squat, who cares where you feel it, unless of course something's hurting and not feeling right, in which mm. case definitely pay attention. But if you're doing the movement, make sure you, you perfect the movement itself and don't worry about the muscles that you're using. So how can I maximize efficiency and effectiveness with the bench press so that it feels the best and I can lift the most weight? How can I practice my deadlift so that it feels the tightest, the smoothest, there's no leaking energy, and yeah. I can lift the most weight. Same thing with the squat. So there's a couple of things with that in terms of like shifting instead of trying to feel your, your way through the muscle and just focusing on the movement. So the bar path and, and, and yeah. to be able to kind of create uh, the most optimal uh, alignment and path and, and any kind of stray away from that is going to be a leak of uh, performance and, and to also be able to uh, prevent your body from shifting and, and 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 stop it from rotating and you know these are all, all considerations especially you know with performance and athletes and athletes 
um, that um, you know th this is this is a totally different mindset. So coming in with a different mindset instead of you know trying to to highlight certain muscle groups and, and really be able to feel them contributing, it's more about like the control of the movement, where you want everything to to end up, when you need to add and intensify uh, the amount of effort uh, you're, you're putting into that movement. So uh, it's just a completely different mindset shift. One of the best tools I've ever seen in regards to what we're talking about right now is an app called Iron Path. I just think that I wish this was around when I first was kind of coming up and it, it, it completely highlights what we're talking about right now, which is just focusing on the movement, especially when we talk about the, the deadlift and the squat and these, those movements are so technical and to have this and what it is, if you've never seen this app, it's a free app downloaded. I think it's a must have, you set your phone up, you record yourself doing your deadlift or squat, and it and it actually tracks the bar path. Mm -hmm. It draws a line, right? So in the video, you see me deadlift, and it has this little, you know, hopefully it's not squiggly. Hopefully it's as straight as possible, and it's following the same path. Mm -hmm. But what you see is it actually, there's a lot of this kind of forward and back or whatever like that. That's and, all leaks in power. That's right. And 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 it gives you something, instead of caring about how much weight you're loading on it, is it put enough weight on there that you can feel, mm -hmm. feel the movement, and then perfect that and get so good at it that you could get it to be perfect without you having to record and critique and go back and forth. Like that's using something, a tool like that, I think is so right. valuable. I'm going to use an analogy so people understand when we talk about like power leaks, right? So imagine you're blowing into a straw and at the end of the straw is uh, like a spit wad, right? Remember when you used to shoot spit wads across the room? So you've got like a piece of paper at the end and the goal is to blow into the straw as hard as you can to shoot that spit wad out, right? But now imagine the straw has got holes along the sides of it, like it's a flute, and you blow in it real hard. The, not a lot of power is going to get to that spit wad. You're not going to be able to generate a lot of force. Now imagine if you seal those holes up and there's zero leakage. You blow on the straw and all that force goes through the straw to the spit wad. Now you've generated a tremendous amount of power. So this is what practicing the movements does, is you're able to maximize where your strength and power goes, minimize any leakages in power. Control and direct it. That's right. All right, number three is prime properly to help you summon max central nervous system power. All right, what the hell does that mean? I'll give you guys, I'll tell a story um, of the first time I ever experienced what the hell this was for myself. So years ago, now when we were kids, growing up in the 90s, the exercise that everybody compared strength over was the bench press. This was the this was the lift. So yeah. if you worked out and your buddies found out that you worked out- How much you bench? Nobody cared about anything but the bench, right? <laughs> How you much bench? you bench? That was it. That was a test of strength. Was so, bench mark, was that also associated with that? Or that's like came from somewhere else? No, oh, that's I think interesting. That's something, yeah, that is interesting. What does that come from, Doug? Yeah, that's a benchmark. I don't know. No yeah, idea. Let's, let's look it up and see because uh, that's interesting. But anyway, anyway, I uh, it was it, that was the exercise. So, uh, you know, like all kids in the 90s who worked out, I focused a lot on the bench press because this is what people were going to ask me about. And I got stuck. I don't remember what the weight was I got stuck at, but I just couldn't lift anymore. Couldn't figure out what the hell's going on. Um, I had this just, it just wasn't working. And then I was reading uh, Muscle Magazine. And back in those days, it, was, it might have been a Flex Magazine or something. And there was something in there called a shoulder horn. I think they still sell it. Yeah. And by the way, this is a, this is a like, not ideal way to prime, but it was priming nonetheless. It was better than anything I'd ever done before, right? So I, I, I look at this article and it says, increase the, the strength of your bench press by strengthening your rotator cuff muscles. Okay. And I said, huh. I mean, I'm willing to give it a shot. And, you know, being a kid and I had a job and money to spend and anything that would make me stronger, build muscle, I bought. So I said, let me give it a shot. So I bought this shoulder horn thing and you stick your arms in it and you put you in external yeah, rotation. Yeah, you do this external rotation with dumbbells. And I did it right before I went into a bench press. I grabbed a couple five pound dumbbells did some reps and said, oh, I kind of feel that in the shoulder area. That's weird. Got on the bench press, hit a PR, a 10-pound yeah. PR. And I said, what the? I did an exercise that immediately made me stronger. And Now, the reason why that's crazy is because, as m many people know, when you do an exercise, you send a signal for your body to build muscle and strength. You don't build muscle right there. It takes days. It takes weeks for that to happen. And yet, I did a few reps with the shoulder horn right before, right before I bench pressed and I was stronger. And I realized in that moment, there's something happening with the way that my body's communicating when I press the bar up. There's something happening. And in that case, what happened with me was uh, it allowed my body to feel safer by priming certain muscles, which specifically for me, it, it turned out, 
were not great at stabilizing because I'd never trained them before. Mm -hmm. And so my body didn't allow me to be stronger than it was. It didn't feel very safe. What I did is I- Secure uh, area around the ball and socket. That's it. So I primed by activating them with my CNS. Now my body can connect to them. I can connect to them. Then I went to the bench press, boom, hit a 10 pound uh, PR. So priming properly. Now that was a crappy way to prime. I'm be quite honest. It just so happened to work for me because it was specific to me. But if you prime properly, you really prime properly, according to specific lifts, according to your body, you're going to be able to summon more strength in your lifts and you're going to be breakthrough plateaus. You're going to be able to lift more weight and build more, more muscle by doing a proper priming session, five to 10 minutes before your lifts than you will if you don't. Now this has been, or this has become a bit controversial. So I'd like to hear your, how you guys would communicate to somebody who tries to make the case that, well, you, you don't really need to prime. You just need to warm, you know, up. Pr yeah, warm up, practice the movement. If you practice the movement enough, then your body will organize itself for you to get the most out of your lifts. Yeah. And this whole priming is a bunch of woo-woo mobility bullshit that all these mo Gumby dudes do, <laughs> and it's a waste of your time. I mean, this is a... So yeah. I, I bring that up because, you know, we first talked about the the movement I said that's happening right now in our space or, uh, against the squat, bench, and deadlift and telling people that you don't need to do it. This is another movement that's happened to our space because... And, and I understand why, why it happens, right? We uh, nobody was addressing these things in in the past. We 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 learn some some new science. We figure some things out. We then start to apply it. Then somebody takes it to the the extreme version of it, and we're and then that's all they're doing is a bunch of priming mobility stuff, and they're afraid to lift a barbell. And the truth is, I think that the 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 right answer is somewhere in the middle of this. And I, I think you're seeing the community that's pushing back on the yeah. mobility Gumby guys and saying that this is a waste of time. Here, look, well, uh, here, here's my counter to that. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice something in common with all these people who um, naysay priming before bench, deadlift, and squat. What, what you'll notice is they're all advanced and they're all really strong. Okay, does that mean you shouldn't listen to them? No, but here's why you shouldn't listen to them with this. Because you take an advanced, strong power lifter or an advanced, strong person who knows how to deadlift, squat, and bench a lot, Watch them warm up their bench, their deadlift, and their squat. And guess what they know how to do? They know how to prime their body by warming up with the exact same movement they're about to go heavy with. You watch them do a bench press. It's intuitive to them at that point. That's right. Yeah. When you watch them warm up with the bench press, what they're doing is they're priming all the muscles that need to be primed. You watch them activate their scapula, tighten up their body, tighten up their lats, tighten up their hips, drive with their legs, push the bar forward. They don't just get into the bar and warm up. Now, the average person who's not advanced who doesn't understand how to do this, they're going to warm up and it's not going to give them the same thing as priming. What priming does for the average person, for most people, is it targets those areas. It allows them to connect to those areas. Teaches you how to do those things. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's 100% right. Because I could do the same thing. Look, I could deadlift and do a warm-up set with a deadlift and prime my body with a deadlift because I know what to feel yeah. I know where to get tight. I know where I feel. I'm, you have to learn what optimal posture is first. That's right. And, and, be, and the thing is, like, our, our joints are, are set up for, like, optimal ranges of motion where, you know, you, you, you'll, apply you will apply that kind of pressure and force. Um, and, you know, you have to be able to put your body in that in that position and get and get your secondary muscles to to activate and to be able to respond and to to be able to secure those joints when you need them to but that's a, a whole process you have to learn and so yes you have to be able to segment that especially if you're not getting them to respond properly so priming is where we take that time that a lot of time to really uh, teach and educate those joints what to do uh, before we get into these compound lifts where, where everything is happening at once and you know if that doesn't happen in, we're going to have a leak in that performance. And also that could be something that's a detriment later that might lead to injury. I'm so glad you guys went that direction to explain it. Because if you, uh, if you ever watch me warm up or prime before I train now, it doesn't look like what it looked like when I first went on my mobility kick. And That's even right. somebody as, as advanced and understanding how to connect all the muscles, I went through this training process of becoming kind of this mobility guy where I was doing all the common movements to get connected to my hips and my ankles and my shoulders and, and practice them religiously. And I had a certain order I would do all of them in. And now, and then I see, and then I reaped all the benefits of uh, how much that has helped my movement, especially in like the squat mm -hmm. and the overhead press and bench press. Now... 
because I have learned to connect to all that. I understand the limiting factors when I go into, let's say, a bench press. I know what what muscles need to be woken up and primed. Mm -hmm. I can now sit and, and I have a video. If you go far enough back on my Instagram, and I literally combine like all of my priming in one thing. So I get down in this really deep squat, and I get close to the squat rack, and I do these band pull aparts. But while I'm what I'm doing all at once. I'm driving my knees over my toes. I'm pushing my knees out and connecting to my hips. I'm pulling my shoulder blades up and, and posturing up my chest, and I'm doing a band pull apart. And so I'm literally, and I have now gotten rid of the combat stretch, the 90-90, like, the, like this, all, all those movements, and I've combined it into one thing, and I can, met, but even as advanced as I am, it took me years of, build that. of practicing all these mobility priming drills that we have created in like let's say prime or prime pro and then i've and i've learned which ones really give me the biggest bang for my buck for these big yeah, movements look, that's why this message is so is so powerful because it's coming from some of the strongest people in our space but watch some of the strongest people in our space warm up with a bench press a deadlift and squat and they do the bench press deadlift and squat to warm up for those heavy lifts their warm ups are better than most people's priming sessions cuz they know how to squeeze what, how to feel what, how to connect to what. They've developed that skill. 90% mm -hmm. of you watching this right now, and more, probably 95% of you, need to prime. And if you prime properly, you'll see your lifts go through the roof. And don't don't be naive to think that just because you've been lifting for a decade, Correct. as I was. Yeah, like you can't right. learn. Yeah, that you cannot, that you cannot get. Even, no, they've been benching, deadlifting, squatting, high performance for years and years and years. That's right. right. Yeah. So. so that, and that's what I'm saying is that like you have somebody like myself who has been lifting for a very long time. I understand how to squat and, and deadlift very well, but it wasn't until I really went on that mobility kick and started to address all my leaks. That's right. All the, where my leaks and my performance were and then realized, oh, when I address this, this, and this, I'm way better connected. My bar path is way better. I'm getting the most out of it. Okay. Now. Now I know what that feels like because I've practiced it for a year now consistently damn near every day. Now I can go in and I know exactly how to kind of wake up all those muscles before right. I go into my Now the lift. irony is these same people who do this, as soon as they get injured or as soon as they find a little <laughs> bit of pain, they go through sessions of what they call correctional exercise, but it's basically yeah, they're, they're like, hurry up and let's get out of this phase. That's, that's right? right. That's they right. Don't apply those concepts. Which brings us to the next thing, which is don't neglect mobility. Why? Mobility work, look, if you have instability, you will plateau with strength. Your, the, your body has these safety mechanisms where it allows you to lift as much as it thinks you can lift safely, okay? Not as much as you're capable of. Those are actually two different things. So we've all heard the story of the, the distressed mom whose kid is pinned under a burning car and she somehow was able to lift the car off her baby. These are real stories, by the way. Look them up. Uh, maybe you've experienced this yourself where you did some feat of strength that you didn't mm -hmm. think was possible because you were scared or there was some danger. What the hell happened? Well, your safety mechanisms were overridden by your by your body saying or your brain saying, hey, fine, let's get hurt because this is a dangerous situation. Let's override these safety mechanisms. So these safety mechanisms exist. And if you have any instability, your strength isn't going to go anywhere. Y you might be able to squat more weight but if your body like, uh, your knee is not very stable there or your ankle is not very stable or there's going to be an injury here with your core uh, or with your low back, it's going to prevent you from doing so. And if you push past that, if you continue to try, eventually you hurt yourself. And of course, I don't need to make the argument that injury will stop your strength gains uh, right in their tracks. Which this happens to power lifters all oh the, my god all the freaking consistently time. And so same this, injuries by the way they'll yeah. have the same injury over and over again yeah. this is one of my favorite parts about collaborating on this when we when we wrote maps power lift like I, I always love bringing in somebody else who we have a lot of respect for in the space as far as their experience and their knowledge and here we bring in ben pollock who is an incredible power lifter very very intelligent dude phd and our, I think one of our biggest contributions to that collaboration was this part, because even though I don't have a lot of experience going to meets and, you know, pulling 800 pound deadlifts, what I do have a lot of experience is helping coaching and working around and with a lot of athletes that have trained in bodybuilding or in powerlifting. And one of the most common things you see are these reoccurring injuries yep. mm -hmm. due to no, never addressing these issues that they have and just working through it and mm -hmm. just gr grinding through the process and then until eventually the body breaks. And so 
this was a, a, a contribution of ours when we did this was like this was a non-negotiable like we're going to address this this isn't yes yeah. the program is written to get the most amount of strength out of all these lifts but we also want to address one of the number one problems that we had all seen as coaches for two decades from powerlifting yeah. athletes and this isn't passive flexibility this isn't something that's taken away from performance and numbers no. and, and pursuits of maximal uh effort uh it actually increases which is hilarious to me and this is a concept that i've been trying to drill into athletes heads uh you know ever since we started mind pump is that if we address mobility and it, it, this is an actual strength issue Okay, if I don't have strength to support around my joint, I'm limited mm -hmm. to the amount of force I can produce. So to address that and also have that sort of longevity in your pursuit with it, I mean, it's a great combo. It's, it, it, it sort of like kills two birds. Yeah, if you're, if you're trying to get as strong as possible and you're seeing strength progress rapidly and you neglect mobility, you're going to hurt yourself. It's just a matter of time before yeah. that happens. So, and, and or plateau real hard, right? So- Mobility needs to be a part of every routine, especially though, especially though, when your goal is to pu push maximum uh, weight. Uh, next up is to include some hypertrophy work. So you want to include, if you're doing a block of uh, a strength phase where you're like, I want to just get stronger at these three big lifts, you also want to include muscle building type of work or hypertrophy type work. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, hypertrophy works more like bodybuilding. Higher reps, we're working more in the pump, we're trying to develop certain muscles. Now, why is that? Well, we use the amp and the speaker analogy. Well, the speaker plays a role in that as well. Bigger muscles can fire harder and can lift more weight. Now, power lifters learn this eventually. For a long time there, for decades, power lifters like, I'm not gonna do any bodybuilding style work. And then power lifters realize if their biceps got bigger, they could deadlift more. It's true yeah. because people were tearing their biceps. So hypertrophy work should play a role in this type of training. Now, it's not the main role, Right, the, the main thing that we're looking for is strength here, but it does play a role in getting you stronger at these lifts. So you want to include some hypertrophy work. Yeah, not to mention a limiting factor is always fatigue. And to address that with, with hypertrophy will also help in terms of like being able to endure through some of those grinding sessions that you're going through with powerlifting. This was something that I think that uh, Ben Polk understood really well. It's like one of my, favorite, yep. one of my favorite things about him was if you watch – his programming, which, by the way, he's toggled back and forth between bodybuilding and powerlifting uh, because he's seen so much value of the the bodybuilding training, how it's carried over into his powerlifting. And like you said, Sal, a lot of for the for many decades, the powerlifting community has cared nothing about how they look. I mean, when normally when you if you ask somebody off the street, you know what uh, what a powerlifter looks like, they envision this like big old dude with a big old beer big belly with like that barrel like, belly, yeah, yeah, kind of a strong man kind of look to their their physique because they don't care about how they look. But the value of building building muscle, not just learning how to pull or push as much weight as you possibly can, is got massive carryover one of the things right away and we know this from programming we understand that piece of it and so when we partnered up with him to write that program it was cool to see that that was something that he had already figured out himself and totally. that was something we saw eye to eye on. all right last up is to follow good programming this may seem obvious right you want to have a good program regardless of what your goals are but when it comes to strength programming is either good or terrible yeah. and luckily some of the best programming that exists that's out there revolves around the strength sports, powerlifting and Olympic lifting routines. If you go online right now and you look up workouts, just look up workouts, look up fat loss workouts, 98% of them are going to be complete garbage. Look up muscle building workouts. I want to build, you know, nice looking, you know, muscles or whatever. 80 something percent of them are going to be complete garbage. Look up accepted powerlifting routines and Olympic routines accepted by, in, in terms of the ones that people know, like, you know, Wendler or, you know, there's Olympic lifting routines that are out there that are really good. Look some of these routines up, and what you'll find is a lot of them are pretty good. Now, why is that? Because you either put up or you shut up when it comes to yeah, the Yeah, one of those is completely yeah. subjective. The other one is 100% objective. You either get stronger or you don't. Yeah. So when it comes to getting stronger, it's le it, it, you'll get away with less of the go to the gym and just do stuff. You need to have really, really good programming to do so. And luckily for people, there's a lot of really great programs out there. Now, we wrote a program called MAPS Powerlift which was designed specifically for people who like to work out, who've never really or haven't trained in powerlifting for any length of period of time. And I mean proper powerlifting, not just like, oh yeah, I've tried to get stronger, but rather I've never really followed or maybe once or twice have followed a specific powerlifting routine. We created a program called Mass Powerlift 
that lays it all out for you, breaks it all down for you to get you specifically stronger at those three lifts. And because of this specific episode, we put it half off for everybody. Now, just because you may not be someone who's interested in powerlifting, uh, this is what you you'll hear us on our question, live questions when we we many times recommend or give this program away to people because we know how much they'll they'll benefit from it, even if it's just a normal oh, for metabolism boost fat loss person yeah. or how many times have we had somebody who is obsessed with their food and the diet and the way they look. Like right. one of the first things we tell them to do is to get away from that, focus on a metric like just getting stronger. And so running a program that really is just focuses on four or five of the big main lifts and really drills at home has tremendous value no matter what your pursuit is. So if you've never ran a powerlifting program for like a three month stint before, not just doing some of those exercises, but actually programming to get specifically stronger in those lifts. This is a, a must at least once in your, in your training life. That's for sure. right. So if you're interested, we're putting a 50% off specifically because of this episode, you can find it at mapspowerlift.com, but you have to use the code uh, power 50 for the discount. Look, if you like this show, we also have some free stuff, more free stuff. Go to uh, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is at Mind Pump uh, Adam. And you can find me at Mind Pump DeStefano. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 